Good afternoon. What a fantastic event. It has been such a pleasure to be here today. And of course, Invest Ottawa, lead economic development agency for our region, is incredibly proud to actually serve as a co-founding partner of Sengen. We fully support their vision, their mission, and the impact that they're achieving, uh, and couldn't agree more with the collaborative approach that they've adopted in terms of their success model. Here in Ottawa, in fact, um, next generation networks make a very critical contribution to our economy, both locally and nationally. And I wanted to just take a moment to highlight some of the pride we have in the statistics um, that really underpin the strength we have in Canada's capital and, of course, more broadly across the country. Did you know 90% of the industrial R&D and telecommunications takes place in Ottawa? We have the top five mobile backhaul equipment vendors in this city and the top 10 optical network hardware vendors. And of course, when you couple this and pool it with other capabilities right across the country, and we're thrilled to see so many from coast to coast here today, um, Canada is truly a force to be reckoned with in next generation networks and associated applications like we heard about this morning from Jacob Glick. Given that Sengen is founded on a collaborative model and Invest Ottawa is so proud to collaborate with Sengen, all the companies, the stakeholders, the investors and partners uh, across the region and across the country, um, we are truly proud to be here today. And of course, for this pitch competition, there's no one better to speak to the caliber of the startups, the scale-ups and the multinationals we work with than the gentleman next to me, Nick Quain, our Vice President, Venture Development. Thank you, Sonia. Um, so excited to be here, excited to be part of the pitch contest. I always love pitch contest. Um, and excited to be here as part of Sengen uh, Summit. Um, as an organization that deals with dozens of founders every day and literally hundreds every month, it's been really cool over the last, and for those of you who've been in Ottawa to watch the sort of transformation of our entrepreneurial ecosystem over the last five to 10 years as it's become uh, much more horizontal and much more diversified in terms of the types of companies and startups that you see coming down the pipe. And, and, and today's showcase is no, no exception to that. I mean, you're seeing from software to IoT to agritech to e-health to AI, blockchain, cybersecurity, the full gamut. And what's interesting with Next Generation Networks is you're seeing all of these companies in one capacity or another relying on these advanced networks more than ever. And uh, so for that reason, it's excited to be involved with Sengen for this event. Um, so to kick it off, our first uh, presenter here is going to be from Breakwater. Uh, Breakwater designs simple user-centric infrastructure for organizations who believe cloud computing uh, should be available to all. And this is Dave Buchanan from Breakwater. Thanks, Nick. I love being in the spot after the dessert. <laughs> so Breakwater, who are we? Uh, Breakwater is a seven-year-old Canadian uh, software company. We have consumerized uh, OpenStack to enable our clients to leverage everything that is the free puppy of open source without the pain and uh, anxiety of installing and running. So we set it up in our clients' data centers and uh, we do the day-to-day -day run and maintain. Can you hit a button for me there? And do it again. One more. Grant, um, what, I would say one of, our, um, one, of the, one of the things we tried to solve at Breakwater is if you've ever used public clouds or tried to leverage OpenStack, it's hard as hell. The interface is difficult. Um, there's not a lot of auto uh, automation or orchestration in the product. So what we've tried to do is essentially enterprise cloud, think AWS behind your own firewall um, for dummies. Uh, to, to put it very truthfully, I can use the damn thing. If I can walk through it, life is pretty good. Um, what are our use cases? Our use cases are fourfold, really. One, uh, cloud for all things cloud. Your DevOps guys need to spin up infrastructure quick and dirty. We do that very well. But we do it in a, in a format or a user interface that enables our clients um, as, as, as end users within the business. You don't need to be a, an, um, an IT administrator to use it. So one is, one is cloud. Two, interestingly enough, are our clients that leverage OpenStack instead of commercial virtualization software. Because we're providing our clients with an open source software platform, we don't charge for it. So essentially all you're paying for is the installation and the commissioning. So the price point is fantastic. It's a cost saving tool for our clients in that second bucket. <clears throat> our third bucket really is um, our clients that are looking to leverage 
multi-tenant technologies in a cloud platform to limit the core base licensing costs. We have, there's some, some big fellows out in the marketplace that um, we all love and, and know how to hate because every, every year our maintenance costs are really, really high because of the number of cores you're exposed to. We use those technologies to limit um, what, uh, what you have to pay in your licensing fees. And lastly, I would say our use case is really about cl cloud repatriation. Um, the, the big public cloud vendors have done a very good job at selling. Um, but it's a little bit like cigarettes in the schoolyard. It's very easy to get into, but then your costs mount. And we're finding a lot of organizations, especially in public sector, where they're nailed down with budgets, that uh, they're getting caught off, offside with the increase in their IT costs because the to and fro and a lot of the more expensive facilities you get in public cloud are truly very, very expensive. Our use cases are the guys who pay our bills. It's manned service providers. It's healthcare and it's public sector. I've got one second left. Thank you very much, guys. Breakwater, a small Canadian IT company that could. Cheers. Next up, it's a pleasure to introduce Bruno Quiar, President and CTO of Crypto4A, a company that's focused on blockchain, Vita X, government and military applications. They develop quantum cybersecurity ready solutions that significantly improve protection for cloud, IoT, and other applications. Bruno. Thank you. Um, I'm here today to describe a very uh, interesting problem that we find in the networks of today. Today, this morning, we heard of the uh, four pillars of um, the ecosystem that we need to build, and one of those pillars is security. And if you think of security, think of that as a security is typically built on cryptography, which relies on key management, that relies on random data, and entropy. So my talk is about entropy, and um, the slide I was supposed to present should have been built, building up. This one is not. At the very top here, what you see is a fairly small diagram and what it shows is how complex, it, how much time it takes for a Linux-based machine at boot up time to generate enough internal entropy from the different activities taking place in the computer. And right now that line basically shows that it takes within 30 seconds to a minute to accumulate enough entropy for data to be to keys to be generated. So if you think of all the virtual things we do today, all the virtual machines that we are popping up, uh, the software-defined things, they're coming up in a bubble. They have no real physical construct to help them build entropy, and that causes security issues. A few years ago, NIST went through and studied quite a lot of the keys that exist out there in public networks, found that many, many keys are actually identical. So and, uh, NIST came up with a solution, which is a national level uh, entropy as a service, think of it as time distribution from a national point of view. It's a very large data center. Um, it's costly and it runs with uh, you know, national level uh, capabilities and, and money. What we came up with is a machine or a one, uh, one new server that has in it all of the building, building blocks that achieves the exact same thing as uh, NIST is doing. So ultimately what we have is this platform which we had built for all sorts of different use cases. This one was the first one we thought was a simple uh, demonstration of the capability of the platform. It has in it built-in multitude of entropy capabilities, entropy generation, uh, some of which are built on quantum entropy chips. Uh, we're using um, a very simple UI to deploy it, or uh, an interface to, human, uh, to users. Uh, we've designed it to be quantum safe. Uh, from the get-go. So we've heard also today about quantum computing. It's a challenge. It's going to get worse. Uh, our design is all built with quantum computing in mind. And uh, we wanted to make sure that these things could be deployed in a variety of installations like networks and operating centers and data centers. So uh, that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today, uh, one of those use cases. And uh, if you're thinking security, if you look at the bottom stack, entropy is a really critical component. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Bruno. Awesome. All right, next up is Zigra. Um, On-device AI solutions for continual authentication and fraud detection on mobile and web. Welcome, CEO Deepak Dutt. Let 
me tell you about Amy. A short while ago, she was traveling to Beijing when she got an email receipt from Uber. For some reason, Uber thought she had gone for a joyride to the heart of East London for 300 pounds. Now, what really happened was that someone had stolen her credentials and impersonated her. So we asked ourselves, and how does Uber know whether it's really Amy who's logging to the application and not some fraudster who's stolen her credentials? And we figured out they didn't. And this happened all the time on applications from mobile commerce to payments and even banking. The real issue is that today, identity proofing and verification um, is not continuous from onboarding through login through logout. Today, you can buy anyone's credentials online for just a few dollars. Here's an example site that shows the information of more than 5 billion compromised accounts. Now, this shows what has happened to Amy it can happen to every one of us in this room. And now, once compromised, you're now nine times more likely to be a victim of identity theft. Now, this is an issue not only for consumers, but also for businesses. They suffer huge losses due to chargebacks and reputational damage. Now, these problems are real and quantifiable and cost businesses $40 billion annually. So how do we solve this problem? Now, we have this thought about you know, verifying and recognizing users based on the way they sit, stand, walk, and make it very implicit. So we ran an experiment with, the, with tens of thousands of users across 70 countries on 700 different device types gathering 6 billion data points. And what we found out was that each and every one of us has a pattern, a way of interacting with our phones, apps, and tablets that's as unique as our DNA, or the muscle memory associated with our golf swings and tennis swings and such. Now, it is this uniqueness that forms the core of Ziggurat's technology. Now, our technology is available as an SDK that can be plugged into existing web and mobile applications with just a few lines of code. We then learn the user's habits and interaction patterns as they use the application. We take a look at how they type, the way they hold their phones, the angle they hold it, the pressure they apply in the touchscreen, the acceleration in which they move. So reading through hundreds of sensorial data points, we send it through our sophisticated machine learning algorithms to create a highly personalized model for the user and use that for continuous verification from onboarding to login to log out. Now, if we, if we suspect somebody has got hold of your identity or, or, or your credentials, uh, we are able to flag that and uh, stop them before they can cause too much damage. And, uh, that's pretty much about Zigra. We initially came out of academia. Spend, uh, we were backed by nine years of academic research uh, with around protected by over 14 patents pending and granted in this space and supported by Mars IAF, EDC, and BDC on this journey. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Deepak. It is now my pleasure to introduce Kitan Koshish, co-founder and CEO of Yuko Agro. Yuko Agro is building a smart agriculture ecosystem that helps to optimize pesticide and water usage to minimize crop losses. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've had some really good discussion in the morning about um, how Next Generation Networks is helping us in various, as various aspects. And from an agriculture standpoint, um, what I'm trying to do is I, I will try to have a specific use case of how Next Generation Networks can help us grow more crops in a sustainable way, which is, I think, dear to all of us because we do want less pesticides, less fertilizer in our food, but we also want to make sure that we're able to feed the growing population. So. So, so when you think about the situation and you go tell a farmer that reduce your pesticide usage, reduce your fertilizer usage and grow crops, what do you think the farmer says? You must be crazy. My grandfather never did it. I have not done, my, my dad never did it. There's no way that I can grow my crops by doing this. And that's where farmers need help. And they need help in making intelligent decisions on the farm in real time. And the decisions that I'm talking about really affect your crops. So for example, should I spray pesticide? Should I not spray pesticide? Should I irrigate my crops? Should I go harvest this field first versus this field first when I have 10,000 acres? These are big decisions in the life of a farmer and it can really impact your crop yields uh, and your productivity. So how do farmers do it today? A lot of it is based on gut feeling. And the gut feeling is saying, oh, you know what? It's been cloudy for two days, the past two days. 
I should go spray my pesticides. That's a lot of decision making, even in today's date. And that's what uh, we want to change. So when you think about introducing a technology to farmers, while uh, the reason why there is some kind of a hesitance, hesitancy from farmers to adopt this is because these technologies need to hit on three simple points. Keep it simple. It should be reliable. And oh yes, it should show me some kind of a value for the money that I'm paying you, otherwise I'm going to stop using it. And that's what we're trying to change. So whenever you think about helping farmers make decision making, it all has to start on the ground. How can you capture information on a field level, convert that information into, into smart decisions that farmers can make? And these smart decisions are exactly what I told you. Should I spray my pesticide? Should I, should I, put, should I irrigate? Should I harvest? And that's where the next generation networks, I think, plays a big part because so far, the problem of accurately collecting data on a field level has not been solved before, which we're trying to do through the next generation network. And this is just a starting point for us. So as, we get, as we're generating this intelligence on a field level, the future is really using technologies like 5G and, and feeding this information, this intelligence directly into machines, ingesting it into machines, as well as converting this field level information, this intelligence into saying, into bringing traceability and sustainability to a fee level. And that's our mission of helping farmers grow more sustainably. And just closing it, I think it's a collaborative effort between startups, agriculture, big agriculture companies, as well as telecom companies. Thank you. Great job. All right, next up is Login TC to talk about their multi-factor authentication it is the founder and CEO, Diego Matute. So hi, my name is uh, Diego Matute. I'm the founder of CypherCore. We're a cybersecurity firm based here in Canada. So cybersecurity attacks are expensive and on the rise. The government of Canada blocks over 600 million attacks to its systems every day. An IBM study in 2017 found that the average cost of a breach is over four and a half million dollars. The same study found that 30% of businesses breached once will be breached again within two years. So why is that? Well, we live in a mobile and cloud IT world. We have a lot of online accounts. And a big reason for continued breaches is passwords. Verizon found that 63% of breaches can be attributed to weak or stolen passwords. So that's created the fastest growing attack surface for hackers, the users themselves. Account takeover is the greatest threat that organizations face today. Multi-factor authentication improves passwords by adding an identity dimension to the user authentication process. Adding a physical device to the process limits the value of knowing a user's password. So just because someone can steal your password, it doesn't mean they can steal your phone. They're fundamentally different attack vectors. Login TC, through a number of innovative leaps, addresses the top three challenges enterprises face when deploying multi-factor uh, uh, to their employees. Cost of deployment, user experience, administration, and operational effectiveness. As an example, push-based authentication we did that first. Log in, get a notification, approve. We did that. We process millions of requests monthly. We're deployed in governments, banks, healthcare, uh, IT services, virtually every sector, and growing. But where is authentication going? Eventually, CIOs and CSOs will ask themselves, why do we need passwords? Let's just use hardware or smartphones. But Dropping the password would mean back to a single factor authentication solution, so that's not viable. So why don't we use something we have an abundance of? Data. We know when a user authenticates, from where, how they do it, using what device, all kinds of personal and historical trends. So if you authenticate in Montreal two hours later, you're authenticating in Vancouver, it's probably not you. But how do you take that data and then seamlessly integrate it across any platform for enterprises to deploy? Our answer is adaptive authentication. 
real-time, continuous, smart authentication that leverages machine learning, heuristics, policies, and big data to secure uh, authentication across any platform. So we actually partnered with Sengen uh, to validate our approach effectively adds an identity dimension anywhere there's a username and password uh, successfully. So we're looking forward to working with cybersecurity leaders to make uh, you know, the future of cybersecurity uh, safer. So thank you. you. Thank you so much, Diego. It's now a pleasure to call CEO of Adidam Health, Tamer McHale, to the stage. Adidam Health was created to empower persons with disabilities to independently and safely access the capabilities they require. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tamer Mikel. I'm the founder and CEO of Adidam Health. Um, tell you a bit about our company. The company is in the name. Adidam in Latin means accessibility. You hear a lot of buzzwords, including you know, patient-centered, healthcare, inclusive. How do you do any of that stuff if it's not accessible? Uh, look at that from a different perspective. Um, me, myself, and I'm not playing on emotions here, I had an accessibility issue. You know, I needed to be able to create something that everybody can use. So what we designed, what we designed is an, F, an application or a platform called Layla. Now, what does Layla do? Layla is your virtual caregiver at home. Um, she takes, wakes you up, makes sure that your mood is okay, takes you out throughout the day, reminds you of your medications, tells you what medications you need to take. It cross-references the medications you're on to tell you if the medications that you're on are, is good for you or not. It takes your holistic approach to healthcare. So, from the games to the exercises to your care plan. So we took a care plan and integrated a customized care plan and integrated it into our platform. So for every person, they have their own care plan at home to be able to do the exercises that they need to do, take the medications they need to do in the right time, in the right process. Now most of us have this vision of elderly people sitting at home. Uh, I know that, you know, Grandparents are no longer sitting at home waiting for us to go and check on them. So we wanted to create something that they can move around with, go anywhere they want to go, but at least give us the comfort that they're okay. So in a technical word, we created an emperor, cellular-based emperor, that uh, it's an emergency alert system that goes wherever they go. Again, it reminds them of their medication, but they also can contact their loved one in case of a need. Third, we said, okay, in an emergency, what happens? Right now, when you guys go to the hospital, first thing that you do is they ask you what medications you're on. Um, I don't know how many of you go into an emergency with a bag of uh, whatever pills that you're taking. So we wanted to be able to create a system where all that is stored for you. And thanks to Sengen, we tested the security of our system to make sure it's secure. So we have the portal that gives you all the standard emergency contact information that you find right now. But it also gives you your medication, name of the medication, time stamped if you took it or not. Uh, it turns red if you don't. It also takes, it's uh, open source, so we collect all your body reading and people talk about trending. What we did is built it based on automation. So automation is basically set, it's an upper limit and lower limit, seeing if if you're not feeling well, it alarms you based on that. And then for the caregiver, we created our own app. So if you're taking care of multiple people, you have one platform that everything shows on. If somebody is in stress or somebody didn't take their medication, it shows in red. So that way, one person can manage 15 or 20 different medical people or patients. That's it. All right, next up is Solana Networks, and to talk about their network discovery tool is President Nabil Sadiq. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's always uh, interesting going after lunch, but hopefully you're all awake. 
I was just, uh, you know, earlier on in the day, uh, was surprised to see so many familiar faces in the room. And one of the familiar faces was uh, an old manager of mine, actually my first R&D manager out of school, uh, John Luscheck, who I can't see him in the audience. But uh, in those days, we were building uh, DPN, which was X25 data switches. So if I reflect on how far we've come from the time when networks were really uh, a niche play in society and made a niche contribution uh, to the running of society, to today when networks uh, are essentially a very important part of everything that we do. <clears throat> networks are essentially like the utilities. You cannot do without it. And so the question now becomes, how does Solana fit into this? What is Solana's role uh, in this domain? Solana provides tools and products that help folks who run networks to do their job better. So we essentially provide visibility into network infrastructure and into network traffic. This is, at a, in a nutshell, what Solana does. So the specific thing that we want to talk about today uh, is one of our products called Smart Hawk. Uh, think of a hawk, a bird that's watching the network. And Smart Hawk uh, is a product that we deployed here uh, with Sengen, so we're very grateful for that opportunity uh, to be able to prove the capability of Smart Hawk uh, on, on the uh, Sengen platform and also to build some business relationships uh, with certain partners within Sengen. So what is SmartHawk? What does it do? Essentially, SmartHawk at the core uh, discovers the topology, the network map. It discovers what the network looks like, and it provides visibility into the way that traffic moves around in the network, the routing dynamics. Uh, it's deployed, uh, and our customers are uh, within enterprise, within service providers, and within the government networks uh, as well. <clears throat> so what are the use cases where network topology is used? It's used for many different things, but it's used for network planning, it's used for network troubleshooting, and more recently it's also used uh, in the area of cybersecurity, a hugely important arena. When we look at it, uh, one may think how hard is it to figure out what the network looks like. How hard is it to figure out what the network topology is like? Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go into detail why it's difficult, but Solana's claim to fame is essentially that it can uh, discover a highly accurate network topology. It's not easy to do. Many solutions can only reach 60 or 70% accuracy. We strive to take that uh, to 90 to 100% in certain environments. It's very fast in the way it discovers the network topology, allowing you to do things quickly. And finally, it's vendor agnostic. So I've also run out of time. So if anybody is interested in learning more about SmartHawk, please come and talk to us afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil. And to bring us home, we have the CEO of SRC Solutions, Eric Simkowick, who SRC Solutions is a consulting and engineering firm that specializes in information and communication technologies. Please join me in welcoming Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm very proud to be here today. Je remercie le Saint-Gen pour l'invitation. Merci beaucoup. And today, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my brother, my brother, my father, sorry, bought me my first microcomputer. And it became quickly my uh, lifetime passion. I wish I could uh, master the machine. In 2004, I've created SRC Solution that you mentioned, a consultancy company in telecommunication. And I figured out that the Internet of Things will change our lives forever. And uh, here comes the question. Do all these sensors in the field make any sense for us as humans if we cannot control them? Think about uh, prosperity this morning. We talk about prosperity. And so I decided to create Pilot Things. Pilot Things is a software that gives IT professionals in the city, in the industry, the control of the sensors, of the Internet of Things. 
Analysts agree that in the five coming years, there will be more than 30 billion sensors in the field. Okay? That's a lot. In fact, each organization is trying to build up its own matrix with a lot of sensors. But they all fail. Why? Because they, they cannot decode the matrix. Okay? So, I agree with you. Uh, we strongly believe that the ne next generation network will be a service. And that's why we have created things as a service. These services include a catalog of sensors that makes them plug and play. So our, we, we, sorry, we update this uh, catalog on a regular basis such that our customer could use any type of sensors. So let's take an example, a use case of the city, the city of Bordeaux in France that uh, is using pallet things. We, um, they aim to be the first carbon neutral city in Europe. So the first step will be to collect sensors, energy information from sensors, like street lighting, energy car, electric car charger, or building. So we put pilot things, and uh, the catalog uh, is used to decode all the data. We could also control the sensors, each sensors, and with the control center application, we could control the world city. We could also share the information to our external application. So now with pilot things, the city of Bordeaux has its own matrix. Um, we, um, so there is a slide missing, but. <laughs> we already have reseller in Europe, okay? Uh, thanks to Stengen, we, we've, we, uh, we have uh, validated that our product is compatible with Cisco products, so Cisco routers. We are looking for reseller here in the US and Canada. Um, well, I moved three years ago from France to Montreal because I, I strongly believe that uh, Canada will be a very good opportunity for my company. So if you uh, are interested to invest in my company, just contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric. What a great way to kick off the afternoon here at the SendGen Summit with eight Canadian companies that are charting the future of next generation networks with critical support from SendGen that's helping to accelerate the commercialization of those solutions, targeting so many different verticals that are critical to our national economy and seizing and capturing new markets globally. So thank you to all of those eight CEOs and founders who joined us today. To wrap us up, there's no one who knows pitches like my friend and colleague Nick. So. Final words. Oh, wow. I, I, I'm just happy we got another acronym there at the end, because I know <laughs> JC was hoping for one. So no, those were fantastic. Um, and now we're going to pass it back to Amy for our next step. Thank you.